Hey, have you heard of big data, Hadoop, and all this kind of stuff? Maybe then you have heard about the terminology MapReduce as well. Today we are in San Jose at MapR. Hi, John. Who are you and what do you do? Well, I'm John Schroeder. I'm the CEO and co-founder of MapR. Uh, I started the company a little over six years ago and uh, named the company MapR, um, named after the kind of the seminal algorithm for big data. So uh, Google Fellows wrote a paper on MapReduce in 2004. That really started uh, the whole inspiration behind Hadoop. So we named the company MapR. We've been off to the races and uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. We're having a lot of fun running the company. Awesome. Uh, what did you do before you became an entrepreneur? Wow, I've been in startups for quite a long time. So I was a general manager at a public company back in the 90s. Uh, I've spent over 25 years in database, storage, big data, business intelligence. And uh, so this is really my fourth startup. First one I founded, but my fourth startup. So I, I was at Brio Technology in the 90s, and Brio got out public and listed mm -hmm. on NASDAQ in 1998. So. Uh, there was an exciting ride back in the 90s. Uh, then I was CEO of a company called Rainfinity, which had a, vi a file virtualization switch um, that was acquired in EMC, became a very successful product line for them. Prior to starting uh, MapR, I was CEO of a company called Callista Technologies. And there we actually wrote software that ran on a, a GPU that would virtualize the GPU and render and remote 3D graphics and uh, multimedia. That was acquired into Microsoft and became the uh, Microsoft Remote FX Remote Display Protocol. So, um, so it's been database, storage, uh, enterprise software. Um, what was obvious for me in 2008 were the macro trends around big data. Mm -hmm. I mean, companies just needed new ways to, to, to connect with their customers in ways that would provide value to the customers. And, Healthcare providers need a more accurate way to uh, be able to prescribe uh, treatments for their mm -hmm. patients. Um, a wide range of uh, governance across financial services and telecom, uh, forcing them into big data solutions for, for storing email archives and call data record archives at uh, telecom uh, providers and carriers. So those macro trends were obvious, and then you could see this new wave of technology um, around things like Hadoop. And uh, so that was it excited me to stay in that enterprise mm -hmm. software space and go give value to those customers with uh, a big data solution that would really serve these macro trends. And how did you then start with MapR? Uh, I mean, especially, did you talk to some potential clients before, or did you talk to investors, or maybe just friends validating your idea? Yeah, all through 2008, I, I, I built a, a really good Rolodex of CIOs, CTOs across industry, across uh, geographic uh, territories. And I, I really just start out with open-ended questioning. Like, what are your big challenges for the next five to 10 years? And why are they, why are they challenges? What happens if you ab you're able to accomplish these challenges? What happens if you don't? Mm -hmm. And uh, through that, that really formed a, a lot of the basis for that you know, big data was important. This was in the top two or three priorities for uh, almost every individual I talked to across industry. Um, then I got more into, well, what sort of technologies are you trying to use? And what do you like about them? And what don't you like about them? And how ideally would you like them to work? And that's where, um, while the, the trend, the macro trend for big data was obvious, which technologies, you can imagine 2008, it wasn't just Hadoop, it was Hadoop and Cassandra and MongoDB and Couchbase and Membase and Hypertable and Voldemort and VoltDB. I mean, yeah. there's just so many emerging technologies that the signal to noise ratio there wasn't quite as strong, but you could see a little more market share for Hadoop. But more importantly, uh, my co-founder, uh, MC Srivas, who was working at Google at the time, he and I could look at it and see how could we grow Hadoop to really cover all the big data needs. Mm -hmm. So all these technologies started out in kind of a niche. You know, and Hadoop's niche was batch predicted analytics yeah. at scale. Well, that's a part of what the customers need, but they also need interactive, they need primary storage, they need real time, mm -hmm. they need messaging. So one of the reasons we chose Hadoop was uh, being able to see that we could grow the technology to really handle 100% of the customer's use case. Mm -hmm. So then based on that, well, if you've been in the Valley for a long time, you know, you've got Sand Hill Road and you <laughs> find your friends on Sand Hill Road and uh, you put together a good business plan. We, uh, uh, in my case, I always like to have a consortium of two really 
tier one investors in my A round. So in this case, uh, we, we chose Lightspeed Venture Partners and NEA, and they split that round. And then you've got two investors with deep pockets at the table. If you've got good investors, they've got great networks to talent, they've got great networks to customers. So, you know, I met my senior vice president of product uh, management through NEA, and I actually met my co-founder through uh, Lightspeed. Oh, really? oh, cool. So we put uh, two tier ones in that A round, and, and, it, and that was very important, and that sets you up for future funding. Because when you go out for your B round, well, to get another tier one investor, you need to have tier ones in your A round, in most <laughs> cases. Yeah, so this means first you validated your idea with some of your connections, so to speak. Yeah. Then you uh, used your connections uh, on Central Road for raising some money. What was the next step? Did you fully build your kind of platform and acquired uh, tons of uh, customers already? Or did you only like ship the MVP and try to validate whether there's some, some real kind of customer demand? We, it took us about a year and a half to get into beta. Mm -hmm. So we had a, uh, this pleasant year and a half experience. If you can imagine during the company you set your own milestones and then you're the one who judges whether you made the milestones or not. So yeah. it's kind of the, the least pressure stage of the company um, compared to now where we've got a quarterly number that we march to every quarter. Um, what we did is we kept in, in, in contact with those 40 some odd customers that we'd done the primary research with and then we grew from there. We kept adding more customers to continually validate the concept and then put product prototypes in front of them and get their feedback. So once we got to our beta period, I think we had 37 companies in beta and we exited our beta program with uh, just under a million dollars in sales. Oh. So, you know, by staying really in contact with those customers, we were building the product they needed. Um, so it was no surprise that they bought once uh, the product was ready to run. Cool. Let's talk about the business model of MapArm. Yeah. So, John, uh, what are the target customers? Yeah, I mean, we're a, we're a platform sales. So it's, a, it, it's not a Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm, find a little niche. This is, we sell to just about everybody in the top financial services market. Telecom is our, our number two market segment. Uh, we do about 25% of our business to Web 2.0s. Mm -hmm. So companies like you know Comscore, Rubicon Project, Millennial Media, companies like that. Uh, so it's very horizontal. We've got customers that have bought over a million dollars worth of software in eight different vertical markets. Um, we're about 70% domestic, about 30% rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the uptick for the product's been really strong in uh, Japan, Korea, as well as the countries you'd expect in, uh, in EMEA as well. Okay, cool. How is your product or product offering comparing to competitors offering? And it's kind of a continuation of your question on business model, which is mm -hmm. um, like everyone in a, in, in a Hadoop space or in a big data space, the way to build ubiquity for a platform is through open source. I mean, mm -hmm. you get tremendous innovation uh, and you have comfort from the customers that they're using something that's industry standard. There's basically a, a reference implementation available in, in our case and uh, provided by Apache software. Mm -hmm. So uh, that builds the ubiquity, that builds the pull in the market, that gets uh, cu customers very comfortable. And then what we did is we, uh, we looked at Hadoop, but it's very early in its technology life cycle. So it's open for massive innovations. You know, how did you take this batch predictive database and really make it intera interactive, then real time, and then even support real time messaging? So that's where we built our differentiating technology as a platform that can run that open source. And, um, and, and so that's the concept of, of how we ship our product and that drives a different business model. So rather than just selling services and support around free software, we've got value in our software. Um, and we sell the value of that software to our customer in the, in, in the form of software subscriptions. So we end up being, unlike most of the others in the space, very high gross margin, we have, are less capital intensive, uh, which for an entrepreneur, you know, every dollar you raise is uh, is also taking some stock out of your pocket. Yeah. So you you have to fully capitalize your company and make sure that you can uh, spend at the rates to be successful and build the company that you want. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you don't have to create a business model that's too capital hungry, and that's been very very uh, impactful, negatively impactful for a lot of companies mm -hmm. that try to build open source companies because. They're so capital intensive that they end up raising hundreds of millions of dollars and then having a hard time 
um, making those investors happy, and then also maintaining the, the equity value for the, for the employees of the company as well. Um, big data is a buzzword um, nowadays. Um, and lots of people know that, for example, you take some data sources, plug it into a, or push it into the, the HDFS, and then you have some kind of batch analytics processing. You also said that you have this kind of real-time analytics right. uh, solutions. How does that work? Yeah, if you really look at the end-to-end -end use case that the customer want, is never going to end at batch, right? Definitely, I yeah. mean, and uh, so I'll give you an example. Like Rubicon Project runs one of the largest ad exchanges today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you look at what they're doing, is they're placing online advertisement as people are browsing the web. And so there is a, there's a primary storage component of that. They have to store all the auctions, all the bids, all the asks, and the outcomes, right? And then there's a, an analytics piece of that, which is they need to analyze those auctions and come up with yield estimates for certain types of page views mm -hmm. and certain types of, of uh, publishers. Um, but then in real time, they have to mediate between thousands of brands and publishers, right? And so it's a real time activity. Well, they can do all that in map R. Mm -hmm. And if they try to use an alternative uh, to map R, they'd have to deploy multiple technologies, have multiple silos of data, and deal with the complexity of data governance across platforms. So mm -hmm. of course they prefer to do that in map R. We can do 100% of the use case on one platform. When you think about your customer relationships, and especially the, the question relates to how do you manage them and nourish the customer relationships that are currently having? Yeah, you have to make that the number one tenant of your company. I mean, your customers are not your customers, they're your partners. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to do anything possible to make sure they're successful with the use cases that are deploying on your technology. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's key, and if you do it properly, um, you, you'll have different conversations with them. Sometimes they'll be coming to you and saying, hey, you know, we love your product, but we really need this additional feature set, and, and you'll learn a lot from them. And other times when you've got brilliant engineers and a brilliant CTO, they'll be bringing ideas to the customers and saying, hey, what if you had this? How would you implement this as part of your, your next use case? And you'll be enlightening them as well. So that partnership is, is very, very important. We've had a wonderful customer advisory board. I mean, another, uh, another successful uh, program we've had here is to take our you know, top 20, top 25 customers uh, out of their offices, get mm -hmm. them in a good environment, share with them what our roadmap is, and then just listen to them as far as what are the use cases, what are your challenges, what do you want us to do more of. Those have just been fantastic events as far as really helping us shape our roadmap. And how often do you do these events with those 25 customers? Uh, the formal events are uh, once a year. I mean, we're connected to the customers constantly, sure. but once a year we try to pull together really representatives cross, uh, cross industry and cross geo. Mm -hmm and get them together in a room and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. And I, I would say, uh, you know, three years ago, they, they took something that was like priority number 20 on our list and said, no, you don't understand. Yeah. That has to be, you know, in the top five. And so we moved it up and it was great advice. Uh, last year, uh, MC Srivas, my CTO co-founder, he gave them a talk on how to do scalable messaging. Yeah on map R, and that's where you can see them learning and, uh, and, and challenging them. Well, why wouldn't you do it this way, or why wouldn't you do it that way? And he'd say, well, have you thought through the aspects of either high availability or performance or things like that? So it's a great two-way conversation, and it's, uh, you know, if you can pull together a good set of customers like that, they'll really, they'll really push you in the right direction. Cool. John, this is your fourth startup, and the first one that you started yourself. Yeah. Uh, over those four startups, what have been the major obstacles that you've seen, and how did you overcome them or manage them? I mean, I've been very fortunate. I mean, I've had one public company and two successful acquisitions, and then, you know, MapR has been a really fun ride. And to be honest with you, MapR has been the straightest line from A to B yeah. of all of them. The, the other ones all needed some sort of strategic change. Mm -hmm. um, so with MapR, we were able to set a course and stay very, very you know, close to that course over time. Um, the challenges, I think uh, you have to be resilient if you think about uh, the different attributes, especially in Silicon Valley or in tech, that people value. They value the brightest of the bright, right? Mm -hmm. And then work ethic. I mean, the work ethic in tech is epic. I mean, you know, people just work all their waking hours and they love it. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, it's not they're grueling, you know, unhappy working yeah. at 10 o'clock at night. They're enjoying it. They enjoy the challenge and they enjoy the technology. Um, 
so you could say the brightest of the bright, the hardest working, you know, teamwork's a given, things like that. But to be honest with you, resilience is probably the most important attribute because, you know, you, you think about, you know, six years ago, uh, you know, Srivas and I are talking and saying, well, gee, in a couple of years, we're going to have our software deployed running critical risk and fraud algorithms at the largest credit card company in the world. How easy is that going to be, right? So you can imagine the technology mm -hmm. challenges and things like that. So you have to be resilient, and uh, as long as you go after a great market and uh, you team with really, really talented people, you'll be able to go through those ups and downs, and overall, hopefully, the, <laughs> the trend is up, right? <laughs> John, um, imagine your child or so is coming to you and says, Daddy, uh, I would like to start a company and this is my idea. What advice, general advice, would you provide to her? Well, for children or friends or other uh, uh, potential entrepreneurs, I think the first one is really to, uh, to look at the market opportunity. What's the, what's the macro trend that's going to drive your company going forward? You know, so so many of us, like I'm a computer science uh, grad and a software engineer at heart, right? So we get so excited about technologies. And I don't know about you, but like, even when I was a kid, I didn't know how everything worked. I took, took things apart, whether they were engines or electrical devices or whatever. And you get really, really interested in the technology, but you really have to step away from that and look at what's the trend that's going to drive this and what, how are you going to find a very large addressable market? Because... Um, there's kind of three levels of risk in a technology startup, and the, the, the highest order of risk is the, the market risk. I mean, if, if we all wake up tomorrow and big data is no longer important, I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, how do you reposition this, this company and technology you built? Um, second level of risk, if you're a technology company, is your technology. Does the product work as advertised? And, you know, you, you might be able to fix a problem there. You could say, hey, the product needs some work. Let's raise a little more money and mm -hmm. give engineering another year. And so that's a little bit fixable. Um, and then there's really kind of execution risk, which is if you've got a great market and you've got a great product, then, you know, you've got to bring it to market properly. You have to service your company properly. And that's the easiest to fix, right? I mean, you could, you could afford a few mistakes there and you could resolve things pretty well. So, so if you look at those three elements of risk, it means before you start the company, make sure the market's there. Make sure there's a huge uh, addressable market that you can go after. And then you've really set yourself up for a you know, great ride and, and, and you, you should be able to build a great product and, uh, and you should be able to build a team around it that can execute well as well. One question regarding your assessment of the future. So imagine we have like 2030 or 2040. What is your perspective on how companies will use data and build their kind of database and data pipelines? Yeah, I mean, the, the next big wave is Internet of Things, right? So we've, we've gone through this, this whole wave of, uh, you know, just ubiquity of compute and network connectivity and now storage, and it's opened up a, uh, a huge new opportunity uh, that we're addressing today, but now you're starting to see, you know, machines talking to machines, um, and it's going to be a, a whole other wave of big data. Um, so you're going to see it move from being a central a central repository. If you look at mm -hmm. when people talk about MapR and Hadoop, they'll say, well, I've got an exabyte of data in MapR. Well, when you get the Internet of Things, you're going to have to distribute that workload again, right? So if you look at uh, some of the technology we're building now, it's to have a, a small form factor, let's say on a, on a smartphone, uh, a little bit larger uh, form factor on an edge device, uh, and then still have the, the cloud deployment that can be very scalable, but you'll, you'll see it move uh, from a centralized model to a more decentralized model. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the very old model was, okay, you have one central database, so now we have like in 2.0, which is the big data Hadoop world, where you say, okay, at least we have some distributed files and distributed calculations and so on, yeah. and now the th third wave would be, okay, every device, whatever it is, uh, will do some calculations for itself. Exactly. And it's really not new. What we do as an industry is we kind of distribute workloads and then we consolidate workloads and we distribute right, right, workloads. Right. So. IoT, by definition, if you have, whether they're devices, servers, automobiles, smartphones, you got a broad number of, of uh, technologies out there um, that uh, need to be able to communicate, make decisions locally, and then just forward on what's, what's required to the next layer of the stack, right? 
So I think you're going to see, you know, the last few years has been how do you scale a, a large cluster for running something uh, like Hadoop or um, you're going to see much more decentralized processing with, you know, local decisions being made at, at the at the end point, at the edge, and then back in a more central cloud. John, what is the challenge or what keeps you up, um, I don't know, um, waking up at night and saying, wow, I need to fix this, or this is the one thing that you are thinking of? Probably the toughest thing about being an entrepreneur is you can think of the, you can think of the initiatives faster than anybody can do them. I mean, um, I can look back on uh, uh, different documents that we wrote back in 2008, and we still haven't implemented some of that. In the meantime, we've come up with a thousand more ideas. Yeah. So there's just an endless amount of value you can bring to the market, and how you can do that in a, in a way that you can bring it to market, package it, so the market can even understand it. I mean, the rate of innovation is very high. So uh, while you know all engineering organizations worldwide can't get done everything they want to, it's also the market has to be able to absorb it fast enough as well. So I think that's that's the the challenge of you got the reins on the team of horses and you think, wow, I can make them even go faster, but you have to you know go at a speed that the market can really absorb the technology. Great. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge, John. All right. Thanks for uh, having me on the video today. Great, John. So next time you are thinking about data and big data, check out MapR. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.